Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, October 19th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, the bipartisan war on the poor. Then, someone cured of Ebola experiences symptoms months later. After that, how other countries are dealing with the influx of migrants. And megabanks refuse cash for services. That's next. You'll still have euros, you'll still have dollars, you'll still have yens, you'll still have yons. They'll be all globally based in an SDR strategic drawing right based system that the globalists control and most importantly, tax. They don't just want the power to issue and control the currency and be able to buy the world up with it. It's a magic trick, like an unlimited credit card. The Federal Reserve, which is the European bank front here in the United States, the Rothschild bank front on record, has an unlimited credit card, but it's even better. They get all the goods. It all And it's that type of behavior that spurred me to do the research to develop a true nutraceutical formula that was designed to smooth out and help children focus. All of our children are hit with modern mind control. Television, music, fast food, GMOs, sugars, you name it. Young humans have not yet developed their nervous system and are being hammered daily by globalist concoctions. It's no wonder they can't focus and calm down and then are put on dangerous psychotropic drugs. Working with my team, we set out to find the best formula with the highest quality ingredients that children would actually like and take. We worked with the leading manufacturer in nutritional supplements that are safe for children to bring you the most affordable and powerful calming formula out there. Introducing Child Ease with herbs and calming extracts like chamomile and lemon balm and essential nutrients that taste great. Obtain your Child Ease today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's Child Ease exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com. <laughs> An RT op-ed piece this weekend had a great analogy. They said, America is like a bomb. And of course, they pointed out there's different types of explosives. You can have something like dynamite. You have to be very careful with it. It's very volatile. Or you can have something like Semtex. They point out Semtex is different. You can drop it. You can throw it. You can put it in a fire. Nothing will happen until you put the right detonator in. And this person said, to him, it looks like America is filled with Semtex. You can kick it around the back of the truck and nothing is happening because the right detonator hasn't hit just yet. I would give you another example, and that, of course, is the one that we saw just last week with Tesla cars. All the components had been put into place for a self-driving car, but the software hadn't connected it yet until they flipped the switch one night, and then all of a sudden, the car owners woke up and they had a self-driving car, kind of like Skynet, becoming self-aware. Now, he runs through the different aspects of what is dangerous, the different uh, bombs in America that are waiting to explode, what could go wrong. And we've talked about these before, but let's run down these real quickly. Number one, the destruction of farms and a reliable food source. Number two, a weak economic system. He says, of course, that we severed any link with gold with Bretton Woods in 1971. And since then, the currency has been essentially linked to oil. And the value of that has been protected and held together by wars. That's exactly right. And I think it's important for us to think about what's going on with these carbon credits being rolled out at the same time. When we look at the petrodollar that was created by Nixon and Kissinger back in 1971, they knew that the fiat currency game was up at that point. Everybody had had it with that. We're at a similar point right now. And what they did was, by linking it to oil, they essentially started to replace the fiat currency controls of central banks to somewhat of an energy-based control. If they go to carbon credits, of course, that's going to do the same thing, but at a global level, far more far reaching. And that's the crisis that they're using. Just as they've used wars to tie us all to the petrodollar, they're using the crisis of the war on climate, so-called climate change, to justify a world currency control and a world regime for taxation that is going to be tied to climate change. Again, looking at the other two, he says Americans are increasingly on mind-altering drugs. And of course, the one that he's talking about here, the one that is most serious, is not pot, but it's what the big pharmaceutical companies give us. That is the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRI drugs. Those are the ones that make people go on mass shooting sprees and kill themselves. And many times it's not with a gun. 
Sometimes it's with a knife, but basically those are the mass murder suicide pills that the mainstream media does not want to talk about. Finally, the fourth one he talks about is a decline in morals. He said, during the depression of the 1930s, there was surprisingly little crime. People were brought up with a conception of morals, of right and wrong, frugality and prudence were prized virtues, and communities were generally fairly cohesive. But society today is undisciplined, unrealistic, and selfish. And he gives many examples of this, but he points out that once this detonation occurs, once the switch is flipped, there's not going to be anywhere to run. There's nowhere to go to get food. People in the 1930s depression could grow their own food. They had a conception of morality. They had a degree, a large degree of self-control. But he says today, if supply lines go down, you're going to be stuck in a house that you can't heat, surrounded by millions of FDA-approved drug addicts who are going psycho because they've run out of juice, and people who would murder their own grandmother in order to get a cut-price iPhone. And he says that on Friday, it was reported that uh, many people in the medical community, of course, have been staggered about the fact that a nurse who was cleared of Ebola nine months ago, Pauline Cafferkey, has now turned up with Ebola again. And that's caused them to have to completely rethink what Ebola is. We're going to go over how this nurse's case has completely changed everything we've been told about Ebola later in the show. And of course, Ebola or something like it, some kind of pandemic, could be the trigger that will fire this. But the bomb may have already gone off. It may be the open borders combined with an entitlement state. And that's what we're seeing in both the EU as well as in the North American Union. Yeah, the United States. We've got people like Peter Sutherland who are telling us that sovereignty is just an illusion. We've got people like Paul Ryan, and we're going to talk about the speaker race in just a moment. They're pushing him for speaker. He says that uh, America is not a country. It's simply an idea. And he's going to change what that idea is all about, of course, with open borders and with other policies that he's putting through here. But let's look at what's going on in Europe right now. Let's follow the flow geographically. Of course, people are coming in from Syria, but really all over the Middle East and other parts of the world. They're funneling through Syria, going into Turkey, then going up into the Balkan states or Greece and Macedonia, then into uh, Austria, and finally to the pot of gold in Germany. That's where they're drawing everybody in. And of course, that's the incentive, pulling everybody in. They're not being driven out by the war in Syria. That's pretty clear by this point. They're being pulled in by incentives in Germany. So let's take a look at what's going on in the various countries. Turkey says that they are not going to be a concentration camp. They won't host migrants permanently, says the prime minister. He met with Angela Merkel, the prime minister of Germany, this week, pushing him to do this. But he said, we cannot accept an understanding like, quote, give us the money and they will stay in Turkey. He said this in a live television interview day after he talked with Germany's leader about the migrant crisis. Now, Brussels, of course, is trying to bribe Turkey as well. They say, we'll give you money. We'll also accelerate your drive for EU membership. Yeah. How valuable is that? Uh, we'll, we'll see how valuable that is in just a moment. Hungary, the next state up, uh, one of the other states coming up where they have to go through, says that the migrant influx has stopped because they've gotten very serious about their borders. Well, of course, it stopped there where they've put up a fence. It's kind of like what we see in America where you put up an obstacle and it will flow around it. It's like a flow of water. But that water or that immigrant flow is still going to continue as long as there is an incentive, as long as there's something drawing people in, something pushing them towards uh, that final goal. But let's look at what's going on in Hungary. Hungary said Monday that it shut down the border with Croatia, had put a stop to the influx of migrants and refugees. They said only 41 people had crossed into Hungary on Sunday. They said the border closure is working. It has effectively stopped illegal border crossings. Now, of course, this is a uh, key a transit point on the Western Balkan route. That's what I just ran through verbally with the geographical uh, locations. They say that uh, to stem this, they have sealed their border with the Croatia as well, but they're also concerned about Slovenia. There's many places that this flow can go through because they're being drawn in, as I said before, to Germany. From the Greece-Macedonia border, the main migrant route now goes up through Macedonia to Serbia, because I can't go through Hungary, then to Croatia, Slovenia, and Austria to Germany. So when you put an obstacle in Hungary, they just take a different route because the fundamentals are still there, pulling people in. How does this look on this transit as they're going up through their ultimate destination of Germany and some Scandinavian countries? 
Look at this Austrian town of 1600. They say they are drowning in migrant feces and garbage. This is Nickelsdorf, Austria. You can see the pictures there. They say they're drowning in garbage in unparalleled dimensions. Migrants leave their trash as they move through the area on their way to the pot of gold in Germany. And they say this destruction is being executed willfully, deliberately, and with malice of forethought. This is the greatest organized betrayal in Western history. They say that the supplied, and here's the evidence of this, they say supplied porta potties were left completely filthy and unusable. They're not bothering with them. They're just doing it in the road and moving on. They say people in Nickelsdorf felt completely let down by their government. They said it's like the end of the war back when the Wehrmacht surrendered the area to the Red Army, and we were left completely defenseless at the mercy of marauding Russians. That's how they feel about this, because quite frankly, this is a war. This is a war against the West. This war is being conducted by the globalists just like they conducted World War II against everyone. It was the globalist arm, the bankers, who were arming both sides of this, and they're the ones who are pushing this destruction of open borders. They say one unsettled female volunteer helper. So even when you try to help them, she says we were completely berated as Christian whores. Others just don't understand what kinds of people are marching through the land, completely uncontrolled, completely unregistered, but with the blessing of the government. They say some of them were way too tall for Chinese people. Supposedly they were from Mongolia or similar areas. There were colored people in all shades, but hardly any Syrians. You understand, this is not about taking Syrian refugees. This is simply about opening the borders to economic refugees, to Islamic colonizers. This is what the globalists want. They want to take down the Western economies because they are the ones, Europe and America are the only ones who could possibly stand up to the globalists and stop their plans. Now, what does this look like in Germany? In Germany, there are anti-migrant rallies that are uh, part of the backlash. We had a vote uh, yesterday uh, in Switzerland that uh, was a historic strong result for a populist party known for its virulent campaigns against immigrants and Islam. What are they doing to counteract this? Well, it was just a couple of weeks ago that we had the Strong Cities Network that was introduced at the UN along with the American government. The Department of Justice pulled into that. That is a movement that began in Europe. It's being run by a think tank that labels anyone who is anti-immigrant or anti-Islam as an extremist, as a terrorist. And they're tying this in now with law enforcement. That's what Strong Cities Network is about. It's about shutting down any opposition to this using law enforcement. It's not working for them to use political correctness to try to shame people because people understand what is being, what is being done to their country. So now they're going to use the Billy Club of Law Enforcement. We have this article today, moving toward a one world government, a one world economy, and a one world religion. This is from Michael Schneider of Economic Collapse, and he lays it out precisely what is happening with all of this, because it is all part, just the immigrant and open borders issue is just one facet of this. He says, thanks to the series of interlocking treaties and international agreements, because that's a key part of this as well, the governance of this planet is increasingly becoming globalized and centralized, but most people don't seem alarmed by this at all. In the past 30 days, we've seen some of the biggest steps towards a one world government, one world economy, and one world religion that we have ever witnessed. But these events have sparked very little public discussion, very little public debate. And he points out one other example of this. Of course, we talked about uh, what was going on with the Pope and the globalist agenda of climate change, making a moral case for that, pushing for one world religion. But he points out the 2030 agenda, and this is a concert that was held in Central Park, the Global Citizen Festival. He says the 2030 agenda has now become global goals. On September 26, some of the biggest names in the music world, including Beyonce, promoted new global goals at this festival in Central Park. And he says we're being trained to think of ourselves as global citizens that belong to a global community. And this is precisely the language that we see from the Pope's encyclical. Ignoring all the traditional concerns of the Catholic Church about family, about Christ, anything that has to do with religion,